Well, thank you. And um, I'm going to talk about adaptation. And I realized that was a bad choice for me because I end up being the last person to talk. And at 8 o'clock in, in the evening, and you've all been having a long day, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hard topic to keep interesting. So I'm going to try. And we're going to talk about adaptation. Some of the things that we've been trying in the Bay to understand how to accommodate uh, sea level rise and the other issues that we've been talking about this evening. And these are not ideas that you should take away and just say, oh, I'm going to plonk them down. These are ideas we're hoping going to leverage. These are types of things that are already thinking about in the Bay that you might be able to use. You might be, hopefully, you can improve on. That's the whole point of this competition. And how we can incorporate those into the real world. Because you'll fi find out that these pilot projects that I'm going to talk about actually sit sort of remote from communities, remote from people, remote from the real aspects of the world. And that's where we really need to get a, a, a large a lateral thinking into the, between the different sectors and thinking about how these things meet to fit together. So I'm just going to set, um, set the scene with sea level rise. We've had some graphs of it. Uh, and here's me adapted to sea level rise at the moment on the shoreline with no sea level rise. And by 2050, we're expecting it to be up to my knee. And by 2100, there's a 20% chance it's up to my armpits. But it goes on. Now, that it's funny, but it's an important point that our designs need to accommodate beyond 2100. So think about how they're going to ad your, your adaptations are going to adapt and going to become resilient over time. We're also thinking about a bay where there's waves happen. You know, you probably went out today and there probably wasn't much happening. It's usually like this. You, you ride your bike down the, the levee and you see some mud flats and some birds and so on. But this is what we're really trying to say. It's the same levee. This is 2005 with a storm surge. Storm surges we get about three foot or so with some waves on the top going over the top. So that's what we should be planning for. We don't get big hurricane storm surges of 12 feet or so, but three feet is quite significant for us. People have been talking about reconnecting creeks to uh, the floodplains. Very good idea. This is uh, Alhambra Creek reconnecting itself to Martin, downtown Martinez, quite uh, intentionally in 2005 again. But this is a common occurrence of combined flooding influences, backwatering of, of, the, of, the, of the creeks due to the higher water levels in the bay. Now, in the bay, it can be due to the flows out of the delta, but it's also going to become more common with flows uh, with, with sea level rise. So we should be starting to think about not just at the shoreline edge, but up into the creeks. That's going to be a problem. And the same way going out, most of our systems are gravity driven. And so we're going to have to pump a lot more to get out to a higher bay. And of course, you don't need to wait for a specific event. That, new, new, that 2005 event I showed you from Martinez was New Year's Day. Well, if you go out on Thanksgiving and Christmas and Martin Luther King Day, you can see king tides. It's very good that they come on public holidays. And you can go regularly go and see things. And you can figure out what this is going to look like. This is, a sta this is uh, 2011, six and a half foot king tide at the on-ramp to 101 in Sausalito. This could be the same picture taken almost uh, as a, every other day in 2030. This could be the regular flooding we're going to get. So this nuisance flooding, it's not the big flooding areas, and that's important, but it's this nuisance flooding, it's going to interrupt operations and so on. We've got to think about, we're already having these problems already. So your designs should accommodate regular flooding as well as the big, big events happening. Because we will have some big events. And this is the litany of disaster. I have no idea why I came here and bought real estate in this area. <laughs> King tides, storm surge, well, they're predictable. El Nino events, we can get a one-foot elevation raise in the bay for a, for, for a good few number of months. And that adds on top of the... Uh, on top of the existing sea levels and all those storm surges. Atmospheric rivers have been mentioned already. This is the uh, far hose of warm, uh, moist uh, water hitting the California coast. Where it lands, who, nobody knows. But when it does land, it causes landslides and incredible amounts of flooding. And then on top of that, we have earthquake. Earthquake is a problem, obviously. A problem when you have multiple levee failures. And so we can, we can we can think about the flooding from one levee failure, and that's going to be exacerbated by sea level rise. But multiple levee failures around the whole of the South Bay, that's going to be a serious problem. And I won't even bother with the armies because they are. Phew. And this is the landscape we decided we were going to make more resilient. It's a great landscape. It's, it's man living with nature. It's Redwood City, the port. Uh, we've got uh, IT. IT companies at the uh, at the top of the um, uh, at the top of the screen. We've got the Bear Island restoration over there. A great 1,600 acres or so of 
of great marsh restoration, which types of things we've been talking about. We've got people living here. We've got a lot of houseboats uh, down in the right-hand corner. We've got uh, the county jail as well in there somewhere. So there's a whole lot of things, but they're all about the same elevation because we managed to build on the baylands because they were nice and flat. And being nice and flat, we also put our infrastructure in there. We put Highway 101. It's just in the bottom right-hand corner. So these are significant issues that we're going to have, which you're going to have to solve, or I hope you're going to solve, in, in, do, in working with this when, for, protecting us against those different types of um, uh, threats, but also making them adaptable. Because the nature that we built upon, that's what, this is what Redwood City used to look like, I think, it was quite different. It had the marshes, it had transition zones, it had beaches, a lot of things, elements, which allowed it to change, allowed it to evolve. Now, we focused a lot. You've had a lot of talks about the marsh plain. So that was, that's something we're really good at. We have a 40 years of experience and 30,000 acres or whatever of restoration experience in those areas. It's the other, piece which, other pieces of it, which um, uh, Letitia and Julie have talked about, which are really important, we think, for adaptation as well. So the marshes will like, attenuate waves. They'll absorb floodwaters if they're coming across. But in the transitional zones behind those, those are areas where the marshes can move into. Those are areas which provide that connection between the upland and the marsh. So they're areas that the, the species can escape to, they're areas that the marshes can move into. But of course, the transition zones are also the areas where we have decided to build our cities and so on. So these are highly contested areas. We've got to think about how we can work with the natural system and with the man system. In the marshes, we have fences and signs to keep you out. We don't have that in the transition zone. So we've got to think about how to, how to use that. And we've been thinking about that in terms of the existing levee line. Where the existing line has been drawn in the sand, where we're protecting, we need to think about how we're going to produce transition zone in those areas. And then in longer term, we're going to think about how we might want to move that levee line in the future. We've got the fluvial areas that we've talked about that Julie mentioned, uh, that the sediment that comes down those. Those are important elements. We could make, make use of those. But also on the, on the shortwood side, we have the edge that, was, uh, that uh, Julie was uh, talking about as eroding. There's opportunities there. One opportunity is to create beaches. Now, it's really difficult to find a beach in the bay because we build on top of them all. There used to be a beach from Richmond all the way down to Emeryville called Fleming Beach. There is about 10 yards of it left and it's just by the Golden Gate uh, racetrack, and that's it. But it's an opportunity to use coarser material as opposed to finer material to, to work in these areas. And that might be something in the more urban areas, absorbing wave energy in a shorter distance than a marsh, but maybe more dynamic and more attractive than a concrete wall. And we should also look further in the subtitle as well, thinking about opportunities in those areas, thinking about what opportunities are there on the mudflats. They have a value, they're not just mud flats. They are, they, they are ecologically they have value, but they also do a lot in terms of wave attenuation. And also other structures there, other things like oyster reefs we could build up in those areas. So all these areas could be indicators of where we, where we could go. And then with my clever PowerPoint skills, we have a, um, a, a number of prototypes, analogs around the bay, which we can make use of. You don't have to look at the textbook. You can go and see some of these places. Most of these places in a place called China Camp, which I, Mike Vase is in the, in the audience, and that, this is his local territory. These are places where it's one of the few untouched areas. But we can learn a lot. We know a lot about our natural systems. You should be using, mining that knowledge and understanding, combining it with your ideas to think about how to make a shoreline which could be adaptable. Because we also have resources, not just knowledge. We have resources like sediment. We have it stuck in our stormwater channels. We have it stuck in our marinas. We have it stuck in a lot of places, and we dredge a lot of it. That could be an opportunity to use that material, to move it around, to recreate a more, better shoreline. Another resource that we've talked about uh, is about the freshwater. We have a lot of, well, we have a lot of treated wastewater, and that is, tends to be in pipes underground, and courtesy of people like the great East Bay Discharges Authority, pump all the way up the East Bay and then out to be mixed in the, in, the, in the middle of the bay. So we have resources. That water, that fresh water, used to go down into the backs of the marshes, as Letitia explained. That's gone now. We have our, just our salt marsh plains. We could make better use. We could make a more uh, resilient uh, shoreline if we could make better use of that, of that fresh water. 
The other water we have is oil and stormwater channels. Again, that's piped straight across the marshes. So we have resources. Let's think about how to use those along with those natural systems. And then the huge advantage, which I and worked in Europe a lot, um, is, is that you actually have space here. Because of the Cargill and the Leslie Salt for Work Company, courtesy of them, we have these huge salt ponds, which the state now owns. 80% of the shoreline is in public ownership. So you have space. It might be a salt pond now, but tomorrow it could be a marsh. And there's lots of plans in the South Bay salt ponds, lots of plans in the North Bay, and there's lots of restoration going on in these areas, which initially, maybe 20 years ago, when I first came here, were focused entirely on marsh restoration, but now incorporating features to accommodate the amounts of sea level rise. So when you're thinking about your communities, a lot of communities are lying just behind the salt ponds. And, look, and think about how you would incorporate those into your projects. So we've been thinking about how we're to incorporate those into our projects. And we're going to talk about three things. We're going to talk about the transition zone, which is the top left-hand corner. It's that area above the marshes and extends, well, to some people it extends about 10 yards further in, and so other people it extends up to the Sierras, and we take, take a middle view, all right, it's about 500 meters or so. And then on the bottom of the tentacle, we have oyster reefs, these are, uh, sorry, uh, beaches. These are um, uh, actually shell hash uh, beaches that um, uh, Julie showed an aerial of earlier on at, down by um, Foster City. And then we, and we also have oyster reefs. So we have th not just the marsh plain, but we have a uh, above and below the marsh plain that we're interested in. And so the first one we're talking about is one called the, well, it's got various names. It depends on what time of day and what I'm feeling about. But this one's called the horizontal leve. And this is, or an ecotone slope, or a transition zone slope. And this is really thinking about what could you do if you kept your levee line in place, assuming we're not going to move, uh, say, Union City tomorrow, and it's going to stay in place, but they've got a levee protecting them, what are we going to do, uh, Baywood of that, to help protect the, mar the, the marshes, to allow the marshes to transgress, and to allow uh, the species to evolve, but also to allow more protection to the levee. So we don't have to build such big levees. We don't have to deal with a, a lot of wave overtopping. We've dissipated the waves before they get there. We've got a good uh, a levee in place because it's been protected from erosion on a regular basis, and it allows the, 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 the marshes to migrate. So this is an idea where we're pumping uh, we're taking tre uh, treated wastewater. We created this one in 30 slope, one in 50 slope in front of our levees. Levees are really usually pretty steep, and so when marshes migrate against them, they get squeezed against them. These are, have a longer slope, one in 30 or so. They they. They, they, they move down from those transition zones, those wet meadows that, that, that Leticia was talking about, to the, to the high tidal marsh and to the tidal marsh. Now, the question came up about invasive species. What happened? So when, when we build one of these things without any water in it, it's a dry slope, and all we get are invasive species because they outcompete the natives, because the natives liked having water, and the wet, the, the, that was the, the wet meadows. And so we need to not only create the topography, which is great for sea level rise, but also the hydro, hydrology of these slopes. And that's why we're putting treated wastewater or some other water source in the top of these, and then having a subsurface wetland, a seepage through here, which supports those native species and provides other maybe other benefits as well. And this is a cross-section, again, just showing these types of things. Now, just to prove it's not just a cartoon, this is the pilot study. This is the pilot study. And again, this is part of adaptation. So we built a slope, but we built the slope in the backyard of a, treat of a wastewater plant. So now, this, this is originally originated as, a, uh, as an ecological benefit of something we could do. But, to, to, to help the marshes, but this is actually helping the wastewater people because if they can make this work, they maybe can distribute their water through these types of slopes rather than putting them in those pipes under the ground. And of course, all those pipes were built as part of the Clean Water Act in the 1980s, and so it's, uh, what, 2017? It's time to restart thinking about replacing those. So maybe they could save money, maybe we could have a more resilient shoreline, maybe we could treat our wastewater, wastewater and maybe we could have a better marsh in combined in one thing. Again, this is only a pilot project. And as you can see, it was planted by community uh, supporters, or people, that's me as well, as a lot of people in this room. Uh, and this is about probably like day two. 
This is what it looks like now. And as you can see, if you put a lot of water in and in plant intensively, you can garden the hell out of things. So what the advantage of this is, is it's, a, it's an experiment which has been focused, uh, studied by uh, UC Berkeley and, uh, and other universities, looking at the, the, the benefits of doing this. We know we can build this sort of thing. But what are the benefits in terms of nutrient reductions that we can get there? And there are some very encouraging signs from there, for not just from nutrients, but also from um, contaminants of emerging concern. There was a mention about talking about using, um, uh, Julie answered one of the questions about the, the role of, uh, of brackish marshes in, in organic peat production. That's another thing we're looking at, is what is the production of this? You can see it's extremely productive, these areas, if, you, if, you, if, you're, if, you're, if you're managing them. So how could, is that a way to actually raise the levee as sea level rises by organic production if our sediments are, are slowing down? So these are all being investigated. So this is a pilot project. This is a, an experiment. It's, it's, I, I think it's great. It's not a. It's not a cartoon. We haven't got the confidence to build the whole thing properly, but we've got a, like a coffee table conversation piece now, which we can actually have a, a good discussion about resiliency and sea level rise within these pieces. Another good coffee table piece is the oyster reefs, and this is Marilyn's uh, great. She's been the great champion of this. The living shorelines. You know, everywhere has their living shorelines projects. And, and Marilyn got in first with hers. And she, so this is the Living Shoreline Project of, of San Francisco Bay. Um, but I like to think that all of our projects are Living Shorelines. But we've talked about the upland tra uh, transition. This is the, we now move to the other end, the mud flats and so on. And here we're looking at uh, the role of, of oysters. Uh, firstly, as, uh, oyster reefs, firstly as habitat. Courtesy of the Corps of Engineers, we blew up all our hard substrate because ships kept running into them. So we're trying to replace some of that. We're trying to provide those opportunities for the oysters, and we're trying out various things like uh, different types of oyster bags and different types of um, uh, reefs. But in doing that, um, we're also exp understanding what types of habitats would be good for those areas. So that's another one. There's a couple of sites around the bay. You should be looking at those because they provide local information about those areas. Beaches. This is a Rambaru Island in, in, uh, near Tiburon. Uh, this was the problem on the top left-hand corner. This was the solution in the middle, and this is the result at the bottom. So as you can see, everything's hunky-dory. The, the main thing here is we haven't really focused on coarse grain sediments in the bay. We focus a lot on, on fine grain. Coarse grain may be the clue for some of these urban areas. Uh, you can have steeper beaches. It's, an, it's a habitat we've lost a lot of, and it's something that we, can, we could make a lot more use of. Buyer beware. I know I'm coming. So buyer beware. Okay? At this point in the talk, I usually say, okay, there's a lot of caveats that it's infeasible. Nobody's done it this yet. It's unfundable. Who's going to pay for something you haven't shown you work? And anyway, it's illegal, so why do it? Uh, because we have really good laws. We have the, Cl uh, the Clean Water Act. We have the Endangered Species Act. They protected the bay. That's why we have something to talk about. But recently, in the last few years, we've done a lot of pilot projects. We've done a lot of restoration. Infeasible? Unfeasible? Whatever it is. It's probably not. We, we're, we can do this sort of thing. We've redesigned the bay three times since 1850. Um, the, salt work, the, the people from the salt, the, the salt ponds rebuilt it. Uh, we filled a lot in it for Treasure Island and the Great World Expedition. Exhibition. Uh, we've done a lot of restoration since the 70s. We're quite capable of, or Americans anyway, are quite capable of redesigning the whole of San Francisco Bay. <laughs> Unfundable. No, since t June 2000, last year, the, 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 the counties of, of, yeah, yeah. The nine counties of San Francisco voted a, themselves a parcel tax uh, to, to help restore and maintain the marshes and the, the, the wetlands of this bay. And there's political support. This is a politician talking in the middle of a wastewater treatment facility in front of a lot of raised beds of transition zone just before he picks up the golden trowel to, to plane the, the last the last uh, plant. This is, this is important that there's political support and there's people support for this type of work. This may be something that we should, well, it's certainly something we should be working on. Is it illegal? Yes, it is at the moment. <laughs> You can't put sediment in the bay. We have Macketeer Petrus Act, which stops you doing that. You can't just throw water into the bay. That's why we had the Regional Water Control Board. But those same people help put together the, the bail and gold. So they understand there's a change. They understand that we need to think about how to interpret our regulations and so on. 
And in doing that, that's the opportunity. You need to talk to these regulators soon and early and understand it. If you want something built, get the, have an inter, early interagency meeting because they will, they will, they understand the problem. They need to understand your solution, and then you will help you make that solution feasible. So we have there's a lot of working parties going on. You need to keep up with the latest. Uh, reports coming out about that, that work, about the Bayland's policy and so on. But this is important stuff to make your work feasible. Last two slides. Nevada Creek. We, at the moment, we only have ideas about individual bits and pieces. We have bits of the toolkit. We have uh, horizontal levy. Where should we put that? Oh, all over along that. Looks good. I uh, got the cookbook and oh, a stick of oyster reef over there. We don't know how things all fit together. The OOUs are starting to help us guide that. So we've done some visioning workshops. We tried to think about what would the landscape look like? Oh, well, we could, this is, this is actually a place. So we avoided the people where the people live because that was too complicated. That's for you. But we looked at where the marshes could be. We looked where Highway 37 is. This is Highway 37 was flooded for 29 days this year. It was closed completely. They've got to do something. This is Caltrans, so it's probably 2088 before they do it. It's going to be raised at something. We've got to think about that. So I've got opportunities to, for more marsh. Look at reestablishing upland transition zones. There's a wastewater treatment facility up there. Let's build a horizontal levee. There's seepage levees. Get some benefits out of that. Let's open up the, the, the depositional marsh plane because that would take the sediment that's currently blocking Nevada Creek and flooding the city of Nevada. Let's put that over there. Let's think about reestablishing flows from these marsh, these, um, Creeks which are flooding this area, put them back into the marshes. Oh, and by the way, we've got about five projects in here which are already built or being built. We've got to think about how to work around those. So it's a complicated landscape, but that's when you were talking about operational landscape units. This is what we would like to start seeing. But you see, we have a green line. This is where the, uh, the Ridgeway Rail, the salt marsh harvest mouse, and the plants live. The gray area, we don't touch. SFEI don't, we don't have a plan for the people. And that's, I think, a lot of your teams are really thinking about how to bring those two pieces together. So we maybe can help with those areas, and so we can give you a head start on getting those pieces done. And how do you do it, the timeline? The timeline here is in feet of sea level rise. Existing marshes, oh, they're probably good, but they're pretty high. And they're good quality San Francisco marshes. Nine inches of sea level rise, probably, without too much help. But at some point, they're going to start to worry a bit, and you've got to start thinking, okay, what can we do? So, nine inches, and maybe we should put some beaches down and some reefs and sediment placement, okay? Uh, well, that's going to take, well, permitting is going to take about three inches of sea level rise, raising the money is about two inches, and in buildings, another inch. I ought to start six inches ago. So, we ought to start thinking about this now. But sea level rise keeps on going. This is the first time we've actually had a clock, which isn't about permitting numbers and so on. This is a clock driven by sea level rise. So, at two feet or so, that's no good. We're going to have to do something bigger. We're going to have to build one of these horizontal levees or something like that. Wow, we never built one before. I know they take a, a, a shed full of a sediment and a shed full of money to build. I need to start thinking about this really soon. So I'm going to start a foot and a half beforehand to make sure I really get this right. But you're working on the existing levee line. At some point, that becomes unimpossible. In, unimpossible. Impossible. <laughs> Who invented this language? OK. Um, it's about six foot, about five foot. You know, we're running out of options of our existing, uh, existing line. We're going to have to move that dreaded word, retreat. And of course, we never say retreat in England. We always say realign. We never, we never retreat. <laughs> we're going to realign. <laughs> and I know that was a question that came up again. Realigning isn't about marshes, isn't about transition zone, isn't about course of people. It's about people. It's about the homes they're in, and it's about the factories they, they work in, and things like that. This is a societal question. This is, hopefully, this is one that you're going to be start addressing as well, not just building within our present constraints, but thinking about what a future shoreline could look like. Because if we don't, if we don't, this is one adaptation. I looked at all your videos before I came, and they're very nice videos, but nobody had the adaptable pickup truck in it. And, <laughs> I think this man here is really trying hard. And you can, this is a King Tide picture. You can guarantee you're going to see people doing this. This is driving through the bay and King Tides. I hope our adaptations aren't like that. I hope our adaptations not only include people and the, the places they live, but also the marshes. And I hope that we can give you a head start on that through these adaptation issues. Thank you.